Hi, my name is Matt Orvis. I work with Near Space Launch, and today I'll be presenting on uh, some flight results, including the uh, ThinSat 2 mission, uh, the Troop payload host, as well as a miniaturized GPS that we've developed. Um, I'll go through some of our heritage as NSL, look at the uh, year of 2021 in review, and then we'll jump into the ThinSat 2 mission, the Troop system, and the iStar tag. So uh, NSL so far is 100% mission success on um, over 600 systems launched in orbit so far, um, just 200 in, in the last year alone. These um, products include the Fastbus CubeSat, ThinSat, the iStar communication systems, Black Box, as well as the Troop, which stands for Train Rapid On-Orbit Payload, uh, which hosts payloads. You can see some of our customers and partners down there, um, as well as a bullet about the Near Space Education spinoff, um, which is the division that we've developed for handling all of our STEM missions. So far, we've uh, launched the TAGSAT-1, which is rebranded as Troop-1, done in uh, collaboration with Spaceflight, and this is um, was flown on their rideshare mission, um, as well as the FX-1 TAG, also developed with Spaceflight the ThinSat 2 mission, and a few radios. And uh, you can see coming up in 2021, we've still got a few radios and black boxes, more uh, more troop systems launched, as well as um, some CubeSats. So let's jump into the ThinSat mission. Um, ThinSats, if you don't know, are one seventh U CubeSats. These are designed to deploy in Constellation, or they can operate independently. Um, and so if you imagine um, a 3U as a, a loaf of bread, a thin sat would just be a slice of that, uh, that loaf. So 30 of these launched on NG-15 back in February. They were in a very low orbit, although they're designed to work at all altitudes. Um, this, uh, this was developed by STEM as part of our educational division. And um, while there are 42 slots on, third, on uh, two, two CSD deployers, uh, there was 30 thin sats, so there was several 2Ts and a 6T, and those were all mixed into uh, different size uh, strings. So thin sats are, are powerful um, form factor for a couple different reasons. They have automated assembly, um, so we can pick and place just single large PC boards uh, this, and assemble these things robotically, so using advanced manufacturing techniques. Um, they also um, are very easy to test because they're developed basically as a flat sat, so we can test bus and payload together at once. And they, they drastically reduce cost as well as the delivery times. You can see the internals of a single thin sat here uh, with about half of the, the volume dedicated to the payload on the right side there, half of the payload dedicated to the bus on the left side, and um, not shown are a couple different viewports that the uh, the payload would have access to. Uh, this is a one T thin sat. Um, if there were, if it was a two T, it would be about twice as thick, and there'd be a, a larger um, three axis attitude control system, GPS, um, a lot of extra sensors, larger battery, and just a lot more you can do with that. There are solar arrays on board, but these um, just because it's a two day mission, these were only. These were uh, just to extend the lifetime and not for actual full battery recharging. And uh, the comms on board is the iStar S3, which is our Global Star Connected Transmitter. This gave the students and participants 24-7 live global coverage to their data. And it was made available live on the uh, online space data dashboard that was developed. You can see two uh, picture of the externals of two thin sats here and uh, some of those features. Um, you can see they're connected by a fold-out there. These fold-outs were the ThinSat deployment mechanism. It was uh, powered by a you know, passive night null super elastic hinge. This allowed us to transfer data and power to uh, give extra solar array area, as well as to deploy different sensors. Um, and we also used these fold-outs to connect them in strings. Um, we, we did this to enable sharing location data and power for project collaboration, it eased the licensing process, and um, all strengths had a GPS and a receiver on board. Um, so you can see some pictures of the assembly here. Um, on the far left, you, you'll see the different types of thin sats, where two Ts, one Ts, as well as a six T, all uh, connected in different size strings. Um, this was how they deployed from the two launchers. Um, you can see that most of them are in larger string sets, while there's a few that are uh, single flyers. 
So we had um, quite a few successes as well as some major failures that I'll get into. Um, the successes, you know, if it's a STEM launch, then the success is just uh, most of it just in the learning. Um, they did achieve orbit and were released by their CSDs. We, we had three of them turn on. Um, we're able to verify the Global Starlink was working well, the bus was working well. Um, we did find that there was some um, just majorly decaying battery voltages, um, but the success here was that we were actually able to verify that and collect that data. Um, the D-Tumble system worked well. We had um, student sensor boards collecting IMU temperature data and uh, some different other sensor data. The uh, protection circuit worked well. And um, overall, given given some of the issues that I'll get into, the uh, the satellites were working well on orbit. You can see a snapshot of some of the payload sensor data here. This is some IMU magnetometer data that's allowing us to correlate that with uh, the Earth's magnetic field um, from uh, the uh, location provided by TLEs, and, and then we can get some attitude knowledge about that and verify that they're pointing in the directions that we think they are. I'm not going to get into this too much, but here's another snapshot of payload data um, that was uh, allowed for some good analysis. So let's get into the failure portion of the ThinSat 2. Um, so, you know, due to discharge batteries that we found, the initial transmissions were delayed about 10 minutes while the, the arrays were charging them all over the cutoff point. Out of about 30 ThinSats, only three of them actually transmitted data. And out of a two-day mission, they only downlinked that data over about 40 minutes. Um, so after a lot of investigation, we found that this was due to discharge batteries. We also were able to confirm that they had a good global star link, nothing was stuck in the launch tube, and that the foldouts worked properly. Um, we did eventually identify the source of this battery discharge problem. Um, it was a small leakage current in powered off thin sets. Um, this was through a diode, um, that, you know, um, through the wrong direction of a diode embedded in a solid state IC, solid state relay IC. Um, and uh, the way it was designed, it never should have happened. Um, this was an actual error with that IC. And um, the uh, the current was large enough to cause almost all of the thin sats to fully deplete over the three months before launch. And um, and only a few of them were able to recharge just, just enough to go over the battery cutoff point, work for a little bit, and then be fully depleted after that. Um, so we were able to confirm a lot of things warrant the issue. So the batteries were delivered fully charged. The, um, the battery shelf life wasn't the issue. The CSD doors never opened um, after that final charge event. The inhibit switches were validated, and no thin sets were ever powered on in the launch tube. Um, and so, you know, even though um, there was this leakage current, it was, it was mainly a problem with our ground testing that didn't catch this. Um, if, if we would have been more thorough with our NSL ground testing, um, we would have caught this, and um, we would have just been able to to have a, a later date for the final charge, and um, and those thin sats would have still been able to work fine and not not be discharged on orbit. Um, so given this, given our poor ground testing, and w which led to those fully depleted batteries, the thin sats did perform well on orbit. Um, you know, obviously with batteries that are mostly dead on arrival. Um, and so because of this, we're going to be flying a few of the student ThinSat payloads um, that were from that mission on an upcoming troop mission and making that data all available to the ThinSat participants. Okay, so speaking of, of troop, we launched the, the first of the troop missions, which was initially called TAGSAT-1. Remember, troop stands for Train Rapid On-Orbit Payload. This was on Space Flight's Transporter-1 rideshare mission. Uh, mounted to their deployment ring. This, was, this observed and downlinked separation events and collected GPS data for the ring. And we were able to successfully ID this ring and provide TLE and ephemeris data. Um, this data was being downlinked um, you know, just within a few minutes after it was turned on. You can see some results here. On, on the right you see the, the big cluster of satellites from that, uh, that rideshare launch. And we were able to ID the ring in the middle of all of those using the, uh, the iStar tag product, which I'll show later. Um, this has a new GPS, miniaturized GPS on board. We got a six satellite lock for that particular uh, point right there. And we're able to confirm the ID and TLE 
on the bottom there you can see temperature data from TagSat1 and this shows what we believe the uh, spin and precession temperature variations. Coming up we have the Troop mission, Troop 2 mission. This will be launched on another spaceflight rideshare launch in June mounted to their deployment ring and uh, the size is about 4U um, in a 2x2U two two configuration. This is going to be again observing and downlinking separation events from the ring and collecting GPS data. Uh, this time however we're hosting four payloads and this is going to be what uh, it looks like for future troop missions. Um, so these payloads are fully are integrated into that, are going to be powered by the bus and that the data from the payloads will be collected and downlinked over the Global Star network. And uh, this will be occurring for um, about eight years before it deorbits. This uh, this troop system is is now going to be on a cadence of about every three to six months. Um, it'll be more dependent on on the you know slots getting filled up. Um, the uh, lifetime will again be about eight years, and it'll cost about eighty thousand dollars per payload. Um, so instead of three hundred thousand for a CubeSat, about eighty thousand just to be a hosted payload um, within Troop Two, which is mounted to the uh, deployment ring. Um, this uh, the ADK provides regulated power and interface uh, viewports to space, live streaming data that's downlinked through the Global Star network, as well as um, GPS location access to your data online, and um, and sensor data including energetic particles, plasma, and um, IMU. This uh, Troop Two mission is already completely filled up. Uh, but there is a uh, Troop 3 mission and Troop 4 and 5 after that that um, we still have slots available for. You can see some requirements for a, a, a Troop payload here. Um, you know, it's a little over uh, 11 centimeters by 8 by 4 with a mass up to 500 grams. You can see the uh, switched power and interface. Right now, the, the for Troop 2, it's about 1,400 bytes per day. This is mostly driven by the uh, the power available on board. Um, for future troop missions, we're going to be there's going to be quite a bit more power available, which will allow data rates up to 23 kilobytes per day. So, um, um, moving on, we have you know so we've got this problem with IDing and tracking satellites right now in the industry. Um, so one of our solutions to that is developing this iStar Tag product. Um, this is basically an iStar S3 Global Star connected transmitter with a GPS integrated onto it. And uh, this GPS is, is very miniaturized, so it only slightly increased the board size and power from the S3. So it's still about 2 inches by 1 inch by less than half an inch and um, about 1.6 watts while transmitting, and it's idle most of the time. Um, this was what was flown on TagSat 1 or Troop 1, and um, it showed good results with them, um, good acquisition time, location accuracy, and um, that was what was able to provide ID just, um, you know, with data coming down a minute, a couple minutes after turning on. So that's, uh, this is my conclusion. Um, we had the ThinSat 2 mission launch with, um, you know, 30 satellites deployed. Um, we had some, some good data coming down, but we also had some major um, failures with our ground testing leading to uh, discharge batteries. The, uh, the troop system, uh, we had its inaugural launch, and we've got um, more launches to come with Troop 3, 4, and 5. Uh, we're still with slots available for hosting a payload on those. And then we've uh, developed this miniaturized GPS integrated onto an iStar S3 called the iStar Tag, um, which has been validated in orbit, and um, we'll be working a lot with that um, in the coming years. And uh, upcoming missions include what we, what we mentioned over the 2021 year, the Troop 2, 3, 4, and 5 missions, um, some CubeSats we'll be doing, um, and over 300 NSL systems uh, manifested for launch um, right now. So thank you for listening. Um, I hope you guys all have a great uh, conference, and um, I'll uh, see you in the future.